tidings round, wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human woes abound, let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound, the Comforter has come, the Comforter has come, the Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given, oh spread the tidings round. Wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. The long one night is past, the morning breaks at last, and hush the dreadful wail and fury of the blast. As o'er the golden hills, the day advances fast, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. Oh, the great King of Kings, with kneeling in his wings, and hush the dreadful wail, and pure brings. And through the vacant cells, the song of triumph rings. The Comforter has come, the Comforter has come, the Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the promise Thomas given, oh spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. Oh from this love divine, how shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell? The Master's grace divine, that I, a child of hell, should in his image shine. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found. The Comforter has come. Sing till the echoes fly above the vaulted sky, and all the saints above to all below reply. In strains of endless love, the song that ne'er will die, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come, the Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost in heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. Now this morning I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Ezekiel. Now the name of my message this morning is, Why Does the Devil Desire to Damn You? Why Does the Devil Desire to to damn you, and turn over in the Old Testament to the book of Ezekiel, and turn to Ezekiel chapter 32, Ezekiel chapter 32, and let's begin reading with verse 37, 37, no not 37, I don't have 37 verses in it, verse 17 is the one I want, let's go to the Lord in prayer to begin with. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit will clear my mind in the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you just make my mind clear, Father. Lord, get all the things out of it this morning. And Lord, I pray you would help your people to get all the things out of their minds today. Lord, help them to forget about the troubles. Lord, help them to forget about their heartaches. And Lord, I pray that you just help them to get their minds and heart on your precious book today. Lord, I pray you just give them something, Father. Give them something that will uh, give them the strength to fight the good fight of faith, Father. And Lord, help them to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Father, remind them that they're soldiers. 
And Lord, if there's anybody here this morning, today, that has never been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray today that you'll open up their eyes and take off the blinders that the devil has put on. And Lord, to may today be the day of their salvation. And Lord, bless the preaching of your book. May it be lasting and not may it be not for the moment, but for may it be for eternity, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now, look at verse 17, and let's begin reading in verse 17. Now, keep in mind this morning, the name of my message is, Why Does the Devil Desire to Damn You? Verse 17, It come to pass also in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, wow, wail for the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down even here, and daughters of the uh, famous nations, unto the nearer part of the earth. Underline in verse uh, 18, the nearer part of the earth. It's down below the ground. With them that go down, underline this, down into the pit. Down into the pit. That down into the pit is like hell. That's what it's like. In the Old Testament, that expression is a type of hell itself. Whom dost thou pass in beauty? Go down. Hell is down. It's never up. Down. And be thou laid with the uncircumcised. In the Old Testament, the uncircumcised are those that didn't accept the Jewish religion. Underline it. Uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are, underline it, slain by the sword. Then they've been killed. They've been killed. They're dead. It's the afterlife. It's going on into the second world, going on to life after death. Slain by the sword. She delivered to the sword. Then they've died. Draw her and all her multitudes. Hell is just plumb full of people. Multitudes of people. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of... What's that word? <clears throat> what's the word? <clears throat> hell. 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 Underline it and circle it. That's the context we're referring to. Hell. With them that help him. They are gone down. Hell is down. That's where it's at. Gone down. They lay uncircumcised. Because they wouldn't go the, the Jewish religion. Slain by the sword. They're dead. Asher is there and all her company. Asher is there and all her company. His graves are about him. All of them. Slain. Underline it. Fallen by the sword. They're dead. <clears throat> Whose graves are set inside of the pit. Underline there, a pit. That's type of hell. And her company is around about her graves. All of them slain, fallen by the sword. Underline it again. Fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. They caused terror up here in this life, the land of the living, back here up on earth. Underline it. Fallen by the sword. They're dead again. Verse 24, there is Elam and all her multitudes around about her graves. Underline the word graves in verse 24. All of them is slain, fallen by the sword. They're dead then. Their bodies gone. Which are gone down uncircumcised unto the nether part of the earth. Underline it. Nether part of the earth. It's down under sign. Hey, you know where hell's at? It's right underneath your feet. Right underneath your feet, that's where hell is. All right, which calls their terror in the land of the living, up here where men are. Uh, yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. Underline it in verse 24. Down to the pit, that's what hell is. They have set her as bed in the midst of this land with all her multitudes. Her graves are around about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Through their terror was caused in the land of the living, up here. 
yet have they borne their shame with them that go down into the pit. There it is again. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. There, there, underline that in verse 26. There, then hell is a place. Hell is a place, brother. It's not a figment of the imagination. Hell is a real place. There is Manasseh, troubles, and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them, uncircumcised. Underline it again. Slain by the sword. You'd think the Lord got tired of repeating himself after a while, wouldn't you? Well, he's not tired of repeating himself. He says, slain by the sword, slain by the sword, uncircumcised, fallen by the sword, slain by the sword. I mean, verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, verse 21, all down through there. He said, are you through repeating yourself, Lord? He ain't through yet. Let's go on. Verse 27, and they shall not uh, lay with the mighty that are fallen in the uncircumcised which are gone down to hell. Underline it in verse 27. Down to hell. No doubt about the passage. Where they're weeping uh, weapons of war and they have laid their sword under their heads. But their iniquity shall be upon their bones though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and shall lay with them that are slain with the sword. There is Edom, uh, her kings, and all her princesses, uh, which with their mighty are laid by them that are slain by the sword. And they shall lay in the uncircumcised, and with them that go down into the pit. There be princes of the north of all of them that are all Zidians, which are gone down into the slain with their terror. They are ashamed of their might. And they lay uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword and bear their shame with them that go down into the pit. Now God said all that. He said all that for this verse. He says, down, slain by the sword, hell into the pit. And he repeats himself time after time after time after time for one thing. The one thing is found in verse 31. Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitude. You know why the devil wants you to go to hell? Because he doesn't want to be alone. He doesn't want to be alone. You ever hear the unsaved man out there say, If I go to hell, I'll go to hell to be with all my friends? The devil says the same thing they say. I'm going to go to hell, but I ain't going to go there alone. He's going to take a whole multitude of hell with him. Why does the devil want to damn you? He wants to damn you because he don't want to be lonely. He wants to have companionship in hell. You say, well, I have companionship. If that's the kind of companionship you want, have at it. That's what hell is going to be. It's going to be companionship with the devil. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew and turn to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, why does the devil want to damn you? That's the name of my message this morning. Uh, he, didn't, he can't stand to be lonely. You know what loneliness is? As far as the devil concerned, when the devil gets alone, it's too much having to re uh, rely and turn to God. So the devil wants to have plenty of company. You know that's why people don't want to be alone? They don't want to be faced with God. You know what happens when a man gets all alone out by himself and nobody around? There's only one other person to face, and that's God. That's God. I'll tell you how to find God. Get alone. Get alone. Get alone. I tell you, find God. You find God by just you and Him. You don't find God with everybody around there asking you questions and talking to you and messing up your mind. You find God on your hands and knees where it's just you and Him in a closet by yourself. That's when you find God and get close to Him. You find God at the altar when you're praying, just you and Him. Just you and Him. You can't find God in a multitude of people where everybody's around there all mogulating up and messing up because God's not there. He's out there with just you and him on a person-to-person -person basis. I turn to Matthew chapter uh, 25 and look at verse 41. 
Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, that's a bunch of people, thousands of people, multitudes, uh, Ezekiel said, and in the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, God curse them, and God kicks them out of heaven, uh, ye cursed unto everlasting fire. He puts a multitude of people in hell. Now look why he created hell. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Then you know what? The devil uh, come along and the devil sinned and the devil had a place prepared for him. And the name of that place was hell. Hell is not prepared for mankind. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. If you go to hell, you'll be out of place. You'll be a misfit. Because hell wasn't made for you. It was made for the devil and his angels. Look at here. When the devil fell and the devil sinned, the devil says, I'm going to hell and there's nothing I can do about it. Don't you know the devil knows the Bible? Amen? Don't the devil know the Bible? Well, the devil knows he's going to hell. Then why didn't he just give up and quit and say, well, I'm going to hell. I can't change the fact. I'll end up in hell and nothing I can do about it. But I might as well just, I'm going to go to hell and I can't change it. You know what it is? The devil wants to damn other people because when he damns other people or something involved in that thing where the devil's trying to get out of what God said was going to happen to him. He's trying to get around the fact that God has made hell for him. Why does the devil want to damn you? Number one is he doesn't want to be alone. I want to say this, the devil is damning you. The devil's damn you. He'll damn an unsaved person. And you know what he do with a Christian? He'll take a Christian and mess him up if he can. Take your Bible and turn to uh, turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verse 4. Let's pick up verse 3. Take your Bible and turn to the verse. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and pick up verse 3. Now watch this, what God says in his book. But if our gospel be hid, I argued with the guy for about uh, forty, uh, about five or six minutes, and then Bob Comfer argued with the guy on the street corner for five minutes, and then John argued with the guy for about five minutes, and that guy didn't have any idea what the gospel was. Do any of you know what the gospel is? The Bible says, if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. You say, what do you mean lost? I mean as lost as a golf ball is in high grass. I mean going to hell, brother. Going to hell. Lost. Unsaved. Going to hell. It's hid to them that are what? Lost. Now, do you know what the gospel is? You know what this guy said the gospel was? He had his Bible open up and said the, the Bible's the gospel. The Bible ain't the gospel. If you think the Bible's the gospel, the gospel's hid to you. Or you, you say, well, I'm saved and I'm born again. I, I don't know what the gospel is. You, you better find out what the gospel is. The gospel ain't the Bible. This Bible ain't the gospel. You say, well, that's the truth. Yeah, but the truth ain't the gospel. See, you've got to know what the gospel is. A lot of folks don't even know what the gospel is. Uh, look at here, that fellow says Jesus is the gospel. Jesus ain't the gospel. See, you don't know what the gospel is. You say, well, tell me what the gospel is. All right, keep your hand right there in 2 Corinthians, and I'll tell you what the Bible says the gospel is, and turn to 2 first Corinthians chapter 15. We tried to get this guy to get that verse. He never did get it. Because it what he couldn't get it through his head what the gospel was. If the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. They're lost. They can't they don't know what the gospel is. Now, you, God's people should know. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? Say it again. The gospel. The gospel. Now, you're going to declare it to you. You're going to tell you what it is. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. You received it. Paul preached it, and they received it. And wherein ye stand, you're standing upon it. You're counting in the gospel to get you to heaven. All right? And by which also you're saved. You're saved by the gospel. Brother, you better know what the gospel is. All right? If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, Unless ye have believed in vain. 
Keep in memory. You know what that keep in memory is? That keep in memory is where a man hears the gospel and then doesn't forget it. And then goes along and believes it in his heart to salvation. You say what? Believe in the gospel in your head won't save. You got to believe the gospel in your heart to save. There's difference. Believing it here and believing it here. I got I have never preached it, but I got a message 18 inches from heaven. And you know what it is? Believe in the gospel up here instead of believing it here. Believe it down here and then you'll be saved. All right, let's read on. All right, unless they believe in vain. Believing in vain is believing in your head. Verse 3, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul also received it. How that, now here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scripture. That's the gospel. Now you know some The death of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary for my sins is what saves my soul. When you put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, you can go to heaven. And when you put your faith in water baptism, you go to hell. When you put your faith in church membership, you go to hell. When you put your faith in anything else than the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross, you go to hell. It's only in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. Now back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Believe in the gospel. Believe in his death for your sins on the cross. Believe in his burial for three days and three nights. And believe in his resurrection and God will save your soul. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world, that's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine into them. You know something? You know why the devil wants to damn you? He damn lots of folks. He blinded their minds to the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. Their mind says, oh, you mean Jesus died. No, no, Jesus didn't die. But I believe he died. He, what did he die for? He died for the sins of you and me. They say, well, he died for everybody's sins. No, you still don't understand it. He died for my sin. Mine. My sin, brother. And when you realize and believe that he died for your sins, you can be saved. The gospel is hid. The devil has a motive and has a reason for trying to damn you. He's out to damn you today. Why does the devil want to damn you? Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew. I mean, turn to First uh, Peter chapter 5. The devil's out to do it. He's able to do it. Not only does he hide the gospel by blinding the minds of them that believe not, but he is trying to get a Christian as well. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. You know that saying that? That same to the Christian. That same to the born again, saved, Bible believing Christian. The devil's out to devour you. Devour a Christian. And he devours a lot of Christians. You say, well, he takes you to hell. No, he don't take you to hell. But he messes you up in your Christian walk, in your Christian life, and you never do nothing for God. That's what the devil wants. He's out to get you. He's your adversary. Why does the devil desire to damn you? Well, it's like this. Take your Bible and turn over to the Old Testament. And this time turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Thousands of years ago, back in time before God created the earth, you find Ezekiel chapter 28 and you find the devil. Ezekiel chapter 28, back in before the creation of the earth, before the devil ever fell, before there was any sin, but no sin in the universe, everything was pure and everything was clean, all the angels were good, and there was nobody against God, not even the devil himself. And in Ezekiel chapter 28, let's begin reading in verse 11. 
Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sittest up the sum, now underline this, full of wisdom. One of the things that God gave the devil in his original creation, he wasn't created as a devil, he was created as a cherub. And one of the things God gave him, he was full of wisdom. And he hadn't lost much of it either. <laughs> full of wisdom, underline it, and perfect in beauty. Perfect in beauty. You talk about something that's beautiful, the devil was perfect in his beauty, in his beginning. All right? And verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, the garden of Eden, back in there with Adam and Eve. Then Satan was in the garden with Adam and Eve. Of course, he tempted her to sin. Underline it. Underline it. Why? You say, it said the king of Tyrus. Why, the king of Tyrus wasn't in the garden of God in Eden. The king of Tyrus wasn't there. Why, who was there? The devil was there. All right. Again, verse 13. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sawdust, the topaz, the diamond, the barley, the ox, the sapphire, uh, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the contraburns, and gold, and the workmanship of thy turbots, and of thy pipes. Then the original creation of the devil, you know what his job was? His job was to sing and praise to God Almighty. That was his original place. And he was created with a musical instrument connected with him. You know, some he would take and he'd take all the angels of heaven and say, Let's sing praises to God. And they would start singing. And he was the choir leader of the universe. And ever since then, God's had a prob problem with choir leaders. <laughs> Amen, brother. Don't, you, know, you don't know what I'm talking about, but I do. Amen? If you've been in church, you know where a lot of church problems begin. They begin with a song leader. Be careful, brother, because that's where they belong. I'm just saying this for your benefit. But that's the truth. Amen? And the devil's been charged at it. He was put in charge of the song leading, leading the song. And that's what he was. But he was praising God. He was praising God. All right, let's read on. We're prepared in thee in the day that thou was, underline it, what? Created. God never created the devil to be the devil. God didn't create the devil to be sin. God never brought the devil on the scene as the devil. He brought him on as a being that would magnify God and praise God and uplift God and magnify him. But something happened. Something happened. God didn't create. Don't you say the devil, God created devil. God didn't create the devil. There's some happened. Some happened. Why does the devil desire to damn you? Now let's read on. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. There are four of them found in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 6, there's four cherubs that's around about the throne. Four of them. And the devil is the fifth one. All right. That covereth. He was over top of the throne. He covers it. And have set thee so. Thou wast past. Upon the holy mount. That holy mount is up in heaven. Of God. And has walked up and down. In the midst of the stones of fire. That's in heaven. Thou was perfect in thy ways. From the day that thou was created. There it is again. Till. Iniquity. Was found in thee. What iniquity. There was a sin. An iniquity that was found in the devil. And it's relation, it's related to why the devil wants to damn you. It's related, directly related why the devil wants to damn you. Why did the devil, what iniquity is he talking about? Take your Bibles and turn to the New Testament. And turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse 6. 
And let's see the original sin of all the universe. Let's see the first sin that popped up in God's universe and God's creation. Created by the devil himself. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and let's read verse 6. Verse 6 says, Not a novice. Now he's talking about uh, appointing a preacher in the pulpit and, a preacher and, and appointing a minister. In verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, it gives the qualification of a, of a preacher. And in verse 6 it says, Not a novice. Then you're not to take a man that's only been saved one or two years and put him in the ministry. Why shouldn't you do that? Not a novice. Least be lifting up with pride. Pride, pride, pride. He fall unto the condemnation of the devil. Then the original sin of the universe is pride. What was he proud of? He was proud of his good looks. You say, what should that mean? Hey, brother, if God has blessed you with a good mug, you better be thankful and don't get proud of it. Amen. And if ladies, if you happen to be good looking, you better be careful or you fall under the combination that the devil fell under. Amen. That's what got the devil. He got proud of his good looks. All right. I'll take your Bible and turn back to the book of Ezekiel. And turn to Ezekiel again in Ezekiel chapter 28. And Ezekiel chapter 28 talking about the devil and his original creation. Notice this time a little bit different. Notice in verse 2 it said, Son of man say unto the prince of Tyrus. This time it calls him the prince of Tyrus. The devil has three parts to him. He has the false prophet, he has the antichrist, and he has the devil himself, like God. God is a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God's a trinity. You know some The devil's a trinity too. The devil's a trinity. He has the devil himself, and then the man called the antichrist. And then the false prophet, a satanic trinity. And you find the satanic trinity found in Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 2 says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thou uh, heart is lifted up. There it is, pride again. Thy heart is lifted up. Why, he says prince. Why did he say prince? He said prince because he's connected with the Antichrist himself. The prince. Uh, because thou heart is lifted up. Pride again. And I will say, I am God. That's what the Antichrist will say. And sit unto the seat of God in the midst of the seat. Uh, yet thou art a man. The Antichrist is a man. And not God. Thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God. Talking about the Antichrist. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 27. And look at the last five words in verse 3. In verse 3 it says, I am perfect in beauty. Again, it says, uh, The lamentation of Tyrus. Verse 2, And now the son of man take up a lamentation of Tyrus. And then in the last part of verse 3, I am perfect in beauty. You know why the devil fall? He fell because of his beauty and because of his pride. He said, I'll be better than God. I'll be better than God. I take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms. And not Psalms, but Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And Isaiah chapter 14. And look at verse 12 now. Why does the devil desire to damn you? He desires to damn you because he doesn't want to be alone. Now what causes that? Pride. Pride causes it. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And let's read verse 12 this morning. Isaiah 14, 12. Now turn to the passage. It's kind of a little Bible study this morning for you. Kind of give you a little study of God's word. You know what's wrong with God's people nowadays? They don't know the Bible. They know anything else in the world, but they don't know what the Bible says. 
It marvels me that God's people don't know where so far in the Bible. Do you know where uh, uh, Galatians is? Is it how many you say it's in the Old Testament, the book of Galatians? How many say it's in the New Testament? Well, you got it right. <laughs> But I hope you were not looking around for somebody else to raise their hand. Because if you don't know where the book of Galatians is, you need to get in the book. You say, what are you saying that for? You know, I say that because I'm afraid of some of you don't even know where some of the things are in the Bible. You've got to have some uh, little Bible lesson here. All right, again, Isaiah chapter 14. Now turn to the verse. Turn to the verse. Now I don't always give you a Bible lesson on Sunday morning, do I? Amen. I, lots of times I just preach you the gospel and let it go. But I'll tell you something. You need a little bit of the book this morning. Isaiah chapter 14. Look at verse 12. How art thou fallen down from heaven, O Lucifer? That's the devil. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Well, I was talking about seven. That's talking about the devil. Now let's go back and pick up verse seven. Let's turn back and look look at verse seven now. The earth, the whole earth is at rest. Right at the margin, right down the millennium. The whole earth is at rest. You know when the whole earth is going to come at rest? Over there in the millennial reign of Christ when Jesus comes back again. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. And they break forth into what? Singing, singing. Now, folks, how come you can't sing if in the millennium the whole world is going to sing? You know, some you better get used to singing at the top of your voice and from the bottom of your heart because, brother, this whole world is going to sing when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And they ain't going to sing like some of you sing. They're going to sing till the trees ring out, until the ground rings out. Brother, you better learn how to sing, because that's the way you're going to sing. All right? Uh, you know something? We sang some songs in the street corner the other day. And we got out there with that microphone roaring down through there like that. And that microphone was at full blast, brother. And all four of us men, Bob and me, was out there standing on the street corner. And we just was singing away. And some lady walked by, and she looked at us, and she went like this. All right? Like that, boy. I mean, I said, thank you for that word of testimony. I <laughs> said to myself, you know, and kept right on singing. I thought, boy, she let us know where she felt about it and kept right on going. Another guy did the same thing. He was out there and he got in his motorcycle. I was preaching. And that guy come out of that music store out there. He walked out of that music store and them things, they were blasting, boy, one in this year and one in this year. And he could just barely hear us over those speakers. That's how loud they were. But he saw us. And he knew we was preaching. And he took his hand and he went, oh, like that. And there was a girl right beside him, young girl. And he was kind of, looked like he was a little bit older than she was. And he went over there and got on that motorcycle. And he wrapped that motorcycle up and went in and slowed down and just glared at me. I kept right on preaching. I point my finger right at him. I said, you're going to hell and need to repent. He went, yeah, like that off his bike. And he went up the block, turned around the middle of the street and come back again and stopped at the light. He didn't have enough, man. And he stopped at the light, and that young woman on the back of that motorcycle, she looked like she was in a trance, boy. She couldn't take her eyes off of me. And I kept saying, I said, you're going to hell. I looked her right in the eye. She was only about from here to that second pew. <laughs> I looked her right in the eye and said, you're going to hell. And she didn't move, man. She didn't smile. He was trying to make a joke of it, you know, and he was trying to get me off. And I, I said, that guy don't pay attention to her, but that woman on the back of that cycle, God is speaking to her. God talking to that lady, and she wouldn't smile. She looked at me like she'd saw something drop out of heaven, boy. <laughs> and she got on that and right on that bike, she went right around the corner and she went right up the road and she kept turning and looking like that. I just kept preaching into the gospel all the way she went around there and talking about it. You say, What are you saying? I'm saying the devil will destroy you because of one thing. Pride. Pride, pride. You know why men are in hell today? They won't humble themselves and get down and say, I've been wrong and I've messed up. You know how come men go to hell? Because they're too proud to say they've been wrong for 25 years or 30 years or 40 years. 
for 50 years. Your pride will put you in hell. I said, your pride will put you in hell. Say, what should I do? Jesus said, except ye humble yourselves as a little child, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. I'll tell you what you do. Humble yourself this morning and come to Jesus Christ. The devil wouldn't humble himself. Thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Thou art cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations. He did that in the tribulation. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend. Notice the I will. Ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend up into the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee shall neither look upon thee and consider thee and say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake the kingdoms? The Antichrist will. You say, what's the problem? The devil wants to damn you for the same basic reason of pride. Pride. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. Turn to the book of Genesis and let's pick up the first thing that the devil ever said. The first thing that the devil ever said. And turn to Genesis chapter 3. You ought to pay attention to the first thing a man like the devil uh, and brother, he appeared as a man. He's a being. He's God's being. And he's bound for hell itself. But the first thing he ever says, you ought to pay attention to it. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more susceptible than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now look how he says, Yea, hath God said, you know what the devil has been doing ever since he said that thing right there? Yea, God said, he went to Eve. And he said to Eve, he said, Eve, did God really be that? Did God really say that? You know, he's been doing that for millions of years. You know what he says to you folks right here this morning? He says the same thing. Well, the Bible don't really mean that. The Bible's not true. Well, how do you know that promise is real? Why, you can't claim, claim, claim that promise. That promise is not real. I'll tell you one. Take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 and tell me how many times the devil told you that this promise is not true. Here's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. My God shall supply. No. I can do all things through Christ. Which strengtheneth what? Me. I can do what, folks? All things through what? Christ. Which strengtheneth me. You know what all the new modern Bibles say? All the new modern Bibles take the word which and change it to what? Who. Well, let's, let's, let's do like the new modern Bibles do, like the devil told them to do. Well, brother, I have a new modern Bible on the market is, is, Inspired by the devil. Now watch it. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Who? That's the person. What person? The person of Christ. I can do all things through Christ. No, you can't. You can't sin through Christ. You can't sin through Christ. You can't commit adultery through Christ. You can't steal through Christ. There's a lot of things you can't do through Christ. What does it say? It's not who, it's which. Why which? Because see, the which refers to the things that strengthen you, not the things that don't strengthen you. The things that don't strengthen you, you can't do. But the things that strengthen you, brother, you can do it. Now what the devil does is come along and say, well, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. And he's been telling me that for 20 years. I said he'd been telling me that, <laughs> brother. <laughs> I mean, I was born and raised thinking, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. And you know some for 19 years, I said, it's impossible, I can't do it, I'm not even going to try, so don't even ask me to do it. 
And I wouldn't do nothing, man. I wouldn't do a thing. I wouldn't read. I wouldn't write. I wouldn't fail. I couldn't do nothing. And I thought I was the dumbest person in the world. And then one, God, one day God gave me that verse and said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens in me. And God said, you can learn Hebrew. I said, Hebrew? <laughs> God, I can't even spell English. And you want me to learn Hebrew? He said, I can do. So I took my Greek book and I put, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And ever since then, I've tried a million things that I can't do. And then find out that I can do them. God's promise is true, but the devil don't want you to. Here's another one. Take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 4 and look at verse 19. Here's a promise that the devil don't want you to believe. And he's doing just like he did with Eve for thousands of years. He doesn't want you to claim the promise and say it's not true. It's not real. God really didn't mean that. What does it say? My God shall supply all thy need according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen? You know what the devil does? The devil comes along and says, God won't supply all your need. No, he won't. He won't do it. you got to worry about it. How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to make a payment? Oh, you got to worry about it. Oh, look what's going to happen. Oh, it's not going to do it. What does the Bible say? Did say God say he would supply all your need? Do you, what do you need this morning? Will God supply the need? Then claim the promise. Don't let the devil talk you out of it, brother. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. He's been talking Christians out of it for thousands of years. He don't want to believe them. You know what the devil's out? The devil's out to get you to disbelieve what God says. Just like he, he said, yeah, if God said, he got the job done. You know why he got the job done? I'll tell you why he got the job done. Look at verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Eve, what did you do? She left out part of the word of God. You know what she left out? Look at chapter 2, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16 said, And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely, freely, freely eat. You know what Eve did? She left out the word freely. And you know what this world has been doing ever since? Is leaving out the word freely. You know, salvation is by what? Free. And every man on this earth that preaches a false gospel, see, you got to work at it. 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 No, man, salvation is free. It's a free gift. You want salvation? Come and get it free. No strings attached, man. Get it free. And it's a gift. Hey, if I could offer you a million dollars this morning. I was out there on the street corner, and Bob come, come by, and Bob says, Hey, preacher, uh, here's two guys up here, and they want to borrow a dollar. And all I got is a $20 bill, and I'm not going to let them have my 20 because that's too much. Yeah, they'd have got drunk on 20 boy. They'd have had a good time. <laughs> and so, would, can I borrow you a dollar? I says, Bob, I'll take care of it. I got a dollar, and so I jerked out a dollar. I said, I'll take care of it. And I walked over to these two fellows. They said, We want a cup of coffee. Would you give us a dollar? Not old brain of mine goes click, click, click around. Yeah, I've been down this road before, brother. You want a dollar for a cup of coffee, do you? And I could smell up and boy, I mean, it was, he was about five sheets in the wind and, and one ready to blow away. And so I knew what they wanted the dollar for. They wanted to go back down to that bar again. And I said, hey, yeah, come on, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. And he went back there and we sat down there and, and, in the restaurant there and started getting a cup of coffee and back and forth. And I looked at this fellow and I says, uh, are you a Christian? He says, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm working at it. And I says, you working at it? I laughed. I <laughs> kind of laughed. I just laughed at him. I says, you're working at it and you're a drunk? He says, preacher, I'm not a drunk. Why do you call me a drunk? I said, okay, I'm sorry. I won't call you a drunk. Let me ask you, uh, how many bottles of whiskey do you drink a day? He said, I drink at least a bottle of whiskey a day. I looked at him and I laughed and I said, you're a drunk. <laughs> and his partner shoved him like that in the gut and said, yeah, he is. <laughs> shoved him like that in the gut and said, yeah, he is. You know something? I'll tell you something. You know what the problem with this world is? They all want to work at it. You say, that guy's working at it? Yeah. Just like everybody else is working at it. You know what you got to do? Stop working and come to the cross of Calvary and accept it free. Accept it free. She added the word free. 
I mean, she subtracted the word tree. Now look at verse 3. And a fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, ye shall not eat of it, least uh, eat of it, neither shall ye what? Touch it, least ye die. Now notice she subtracted the word freely in verse 2, but notice also in verse 3, she added the word touch it. That wasn't in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. God said nothing about touching it. Not only does the devil try to get you to subtract from the word of God, he tries to what? Get you to add to the word of God. And you know what the devil do to you? When you get along in the Bible and you open up the Bible, the, Lord, the devil will say, you don't, can't believe that promise. You can't believe that promise. You can't believe promise. Don't claim that promise. That promise is not good. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8. I'll tell you how hard it is. I'll tell you how often the devil tries to mess you up. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 28. You don't believe me. I'll tell you. Now turn to Romans chapter 8 verse 28. All things work together for good. Did it say for good? For good? Did it say for good, folks? For good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. You mean to tell me everything works together for good for a Christian? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. How often can you claim that promise? You know what God said? God said the promise is good. But you know what we say? We say, but Lord, divorce has never been good. Amen? Come on now, amen? Amen? And we look and say, oh Lord, sin has never been good. God said all things work together for good. Does that include all? That includes everything you can name and think about. You know what the devil does? The devil comes along and says, well, you can't claim that promise. It's just too big. It just reaches out too far. It's just too big. You can't claim it. All right, then don't claim it. I'm going to claim the promise. Because the promise is good. Because God said it. But boy, is it hard to claim. You say, preacher, what happens when your boy dies and goes to the hospital and then goes to the funeral home? I'm still going to claim it. What happens if your wife dies? I'm still going to claim it. You say, what happens if your mother dies and goes to hell? I'm still going to claim it. You know why? Because all of God's promises are good. All of them. Amen, brother. You know what the devil is? The devil fell because of pride. And then he sets out to get you to disbelieve God by taking away from his book and by adding his book instead of accepting what his book says. And he's been doing that for thousands of years. Now, it, you know what it boils down to? The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. If God had his way, he'd save everybody. The devil had his way, he'd damn everybody. Then where is the choice? The choice is with you. Will you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, or will you not? See, the choice is with you. The devil can't make you do nothing, and God won't make you do nothing. It's all up to you. What will you do? All eyes closed and all heads bowed, and Christians praying this morning. If God had his way, he'd save you this morning and put you in heaven and take you there. But you have an absolute part, and your part is to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you've never received him, and you've never accepted him, Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for you. He was crucified. He was nailed on the cross to save your soul. And if you've never been saved, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And the devil wants to damn you. And he'll do his best to damn you. He'll get you to turn down the Lord and turn down the Lord and turn down the Lord and turn down the Lord. And one of these days, God Almighty said, that's the last time you're going to turn me down. And then you'll go home to hell. But you still have a chance today. You still have a chance right now. To receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He died for you. He died for you. He'll save your soul if you'll accept Him. How about, it, how about you accepting Him as your personal Savior today?
Is there anyone in the congregation say, Preacher, I've never been saved, but I'd like to be, and I appreciate you praying for me. Would you raise your hand? Is there any in the congregation like that this morning? Is there any that way this morning? Say, Preacher, I've never been saved, but I want to be. I'd like to be. Would you pray for me? Is there any that way? God knows your heart, and God knows your mind, and God knows your soul. If you'll turn right now from your sin and in your heart accept Jesus Christ by faith and believe in His death, God will save you. If you'll accept Him, He'll accept you. It's that simple. If you'll accept Him, He accepts you. How about it? How about it? Maybe there's a Christian here this morning the devil's been lying to and not claiming God's promises. God will supply your need. God will supply all your need. It's a preacher, I got a need. Yes, you do. You got plenty of them. We have plenty of them. Don't let the devil not claim the promises this morning. You can do all things through Christ to strengthen you. Don't let the devil take that promise away from you. And all things work together for good to them of God, to them who call according to his promise. Don't let the devil take that promise away from you. Maybe you got some heartaches. Maybe you got some things that's going through your life right now. And they seem like difficult and terrible things. Claim God's promise that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. You're called. God saved you. He called you and you answered the call. You accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Then they all work together for your good. That to every saved man in this building this morning. You say, well, preacher, I don't love Jesus like I should. None of us do. None of us love Him like we should. Nobody's perfect. But all things work together for good. Maybe there's a Christian here and say, preacher, I need some things this morning from God. I need a particular thing, and God said He would supply my need. And I appreciate you praying with me. I don't have it now, but I appreciate you praying with me that I'll have faith and wait on God, and that God will supply that need with that particular thing. Is there a Christian like that this morning? Amen. 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 Now, don't let the devil steal that promise from you, Christian. Don't let him steal it from you. Claim it and wait on God. Wait on Him, okay? Wait on the Lord. Don't rush ahead of him. Let God God do it in his time and his way. And he'll supply the need and claim the promise. Maybe there's a Christian here this morning and having a hard time claiming Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. You should preach you what I'm going through. Yeah. Yeah, what you're going through. Don't let you let the devil steal that promise from you. He'll do it if you can. You get the promise. Claim the promise. That's the greatest promise in the Bible. The greatest one. Now get it this morning. You say it's for it's for my good, it's for your good. God will work it around. God will work it around. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your people would be encouraged this morning and claim these promises. And Lord, I pray this morning you'll speak into every heart here this morning. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's never been saved, never been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray today would be the day that they turn from their sins and turn to Jesus Christ and receive Him as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray and for His sake. Amen. Let's all stand just as I am. Let's sing just as I am. Just as I am. All eyes closed and all heads bowed in Christian's prayer. You know, the Bible says, by the foolishness of preaching, he would save them that believe. By the foolishness of preaching, he'd save them that believe. Now, I preach just as foolish as I know how. I'll tell you something. God will save you if you believe. 
You say, believe what, preacher? Believe you're a sinner. Aren't you a sinner? Yeah, of course you are. Of course you're a sinner. All right. He saved him to believe. Now, will you believe? You say, believe what, preacher? Believe that Jesus died for your sins? Believe that he was buried in the grave for three days and three nights? And believe that he rose? Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, will you receive him as your personal Savior? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you if you'll ask him. Right now, if you will, will you step out of your seat and come down this aisle? If you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, will you just step out of your seat and come down this aisle and we'll pray with you and show you from the Scripture, will you step out and come as we sing this next stanza, would you come? All I told you for she's bad. You know that song says to cleanse me from one spot. Just one. If you only had one spot, you needed to be cleansed. But you have more than one. You have more than one. You probably got many. And he'll cleanse you if you come to him. I didn't ask you to join the church. I didn't ask you to uh, tithe and give your money and, and come every Sunday. I ask you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the invitation. Now, if you will receive him, will you step out of your seat and come? As we sing this next stanza, would you come? All eyes closed and all heads bowed. I'm going to give you one more invitation. I want you to know you're not turning me down. You're not turning the church down. You're turning him down. Jesus Christ. Now the devil wants to damn you. He wants to damn you. He's out to damn you. If he had his way, he'll do it. He'll get the job done. Now the question is, will you accept Jesus Christ? It's up to you. God's done his part. He died and had his sent his son to the cross of Calvary. To die for your sins. Now your part is to come to Jesus. If you've never come to him. You've never accepted him as your savior. In your heart by faith. If you will right now just step out of your seat. We're only going to sing one more stanza. And then we're going to close. And if you've never accepted him. Would you step out and come. As we sing this next stanza. Will you come? Uh, will you come? Will you come? With all eyes closed, as we just closed this invitation now. I told you I wouldn't give you another invitation, and I won't. I won't. But I want you to say so before you leave this morning. You can still receive him. If you've never received him, I want you to go home with just you and the Lord. I want you to get down on your hands and knees with just you and him. And I want you to pray. And I want you to pray, Lord, I deserve to go to hell. And you do. But Lord, I don't want to go. And Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save my soul. And forgive my sins. And take me to heaven when I die. You say, preacher, that's all I have to do. If you accept him, 
He accepts you. You accept him, he accepts you. And that's all there is to it. And then God will take care of the rest. It's a preacher I can't live it. God will help you live it. None of us live it. There ain't a Christian here that lives like he ought to live. Ain't a Christian here that's perfect. None of us are. None of us are. God didn't ask us to live it. God asked us to receive his son as our personal savior. Now if you'll do that, God will do his part. God will do his part. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as you close this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to deal with every heart here. And Lord, I pray that as we study God's Word this morning and learn more about the devil and the devil's method of lying to the people and lying to the lost, Father, I pray that you'd help them all to turn to thee and believe what you said in your precious book. In Jesus' precious name I pray and for his sake. Amen.